Fantastic. Um, thanks very much to uh, to Ian Shaw for energising us and uh, and with those poignant words. Um, so let's get into our first session, and uh, and this is entitled uh, a, a really fantastic session coming up: unlocking engagement and productivity through a commitment of healthy thinking. Um, and delighted to welcome onto the stage uh, Dr. Paul Engler, who's the managing director of Opera Group. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well, Chris. Lovely to be here. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, uh, really, it's a great pleasure to have you with us again. Uh, fantastic uh, content you always produce and, uh, and and healthy thinking, that commitment, that's what we're looking for. So um, I'll, I'll pass over to you and um, uh, really encourage the audience to, to come through with some questions. We're going to have some time at the end of the session uh, where we'll have uh, a Q and A session, so so please fire those in, and uh, I'll come and join you at the end, Paul, and and we can have a conversation. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Paul, uh, Dr. Paul Inglet. I work here in uh, Singapore. I've uh, been here now for eight years. Uh, originally started Opera back in nineteen ninety seven together with my business partner, Dr. Sarah Burke, and um, uh, we're in New Zealand, Australia, and here in Singapore. So today what I'm going to talk about is healthy thinking. I'll explain what healthy thinking is, its relationship to fundamental um, psychology in terms of uh, CBT and how this can be applied in your workplace. So uh, with no further ado, let us get into it. I just need to. There we go. So, healthy thinking is in, in a previous presentation, I talked about emotions. And uh, emotions are a byproduct of the thoughts that we have. And emotions are ubiquitous in the workplace. They drive work, both drives emotions as well as emotions driving work. You know, work is a major source of how we feel about ourselves, about the emotions that we hold uh, for our self schemas, about how we feel about our self esteem, uh, about our well being, as well as work provides us with uh, extrin extrinsic benefits such as income. Likewise, emotions play a big part at work. They impact productivity, they impact uh, our connection with others, they impact our job satisfaction. So understanding emotions and learning how to regulate emotions a little better, understanding that emotions are a cognitive appraisal of the affect in our body, learning how to handle this uh, is um, something that everybody needs in the workplace. And part of the reason that we need um, to learn how to deal with our emotions effectively through appropriate thinking is because of the type of emotions that we say we feel during the day. These are some uh, statistics uh, that have come out of the Healthy Thinking Institute, uh, where people have been asked to uh, ask to feel uh, to explain what emotions they're feeling during the day. And people mention words such as frustration, stress, anxiety. These are very common. And the question is, how much time are we losing in the workplace? And how is this affecting well-being? Because both of uh, these parts of the equation are important for us to understand, both the productivity and job satisfaction component, as well as the individual uh, well-being component. And psychology offers a lot in terms of dealing with unhealthy emotions. And there are two primary ways. And when I say unhealthy emotions, uh, I'll explain what I mean by unhealthy in the sense that the emotion is a cognitive appraisal of what the body is feeling. And sometimes that cognitive appraisal is accurate and helpful. Sometimes that cognitive appraisal is unhelpful. And we refer to this as healthy or unhealthy. And there are two major techniques that, that psychologists have sort of landed on with respect to working uh, with thoughts. One is... Um, CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. And this has a, uh, is probably the most researched of techniques. 
And uh, with this technique, essentially, one learns how to identify what the thought is, how, what is the relationship between the thought and the emotion, and how do we then dispute the thought? How do we play with the thought? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today in terms of healthy thinking. There is another technique as well, which is more of a mindfulness technique. And in that technique, rather than disputing the thoughts, you learn how to sit with your thoughts. And both techniques have value. Um, mindfulness is very popular at the moment. It's not that one is better than the other. These are two skills uh, to develop. Unfortunately, I don't have time today to, to delve deep into both of these. So I'm going to delve deep into the CBT. Uh, and the purpose of today is also to give you techniques which you can use, take back to your workplace. Uh, I don't want this just to be an educational um, seminar, but also want to leave you with some really useful techniques. So, the, so just to summarize, two major techniques which are well-researched in psychology, um, CBT, and mindfulness is really sitting under a technique called ACT, uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Uh, but obviously those words are not words that we want to use in the workplace. And so often what we have to do is take some of these old wines and put them in a new bottle. And we have to package them in a way that uh, sounds less clinical, sounds less psyche, and is more palatable uh, for the workplace and more palatable for the, the people that we are working with. And we do this a lot in psychology. You know, So we have terms like grit, which you've often heard about. Um, yeah, Angela Duckworth's work on passion and, and perseverance. The literature is pretty clear that most of this is just conscientiousness. It's a trait. Uh, but grit sounds a lot better than conscientiousness. So we talk about grit. Same with EI. I'm a big proponent of EI in terms of its uh, applications. But is it anything more than just the, 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 the trait of neuroticism? Don't know. Learning agility, another term um, that's thrown around. People use this a lot. Uh, makes sense. What it means from a psychological perspective is really G, which is our cognitive ability plus openness to experience. So we take these uh, psychological terms and we put a nice spin on them. We make them palatable. We make them able to be uh, well understood, uh, able to be um, well embraced by um, people at work and uh, healthy thinking is exactly that with respect to CBT. So the science behind CBT is pretty strong. It's probably, well, I wouldn't even say probably, it is the most researched of um, techniques uh, dealing with uh, issues such as anxiety, depression, these types of uh, issues, and uh, learning how to deal with one's emotions. It involves identifying, challenging, and replacing unhealthy thinking patterns. So it's learning what those unhealthy thinking patterns are, challenging them, replacing them uh, with new thinking patterns. Great question uh, on that. I've just had a question pop up, which is how can we build healthy thinking into traditional leadership? This is exactly what I'm going to be talking about as we start to have, uh, we start to put a nice package around some of these techniques. I think part of the reason that it hasn't um, uh, hit traditional leadership is that traditional leadership is often drawn to um, ideas that sound good, that are well packaged, those sorts of things. CBT as a concept doesn't necessarily sound as nice as something like healthy thinking. And what we've got to do is reduce it down to its core components uh, and start to then integrate it into traditional leadership programs. And that's what I'm going to be talking about now. What are some of the key components that we can take from CBT and we can start to integrate into a traditional leadership program? So I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about that uh, right now. So that was a great catalyst for the, for the next slides. The work on healthy thinking uh, comes from the Healthy Thinking Institute. And this was started by Dr. Tom Maholland. Uh, he's a, a New Zealand a medical doctor. Uh, his story is well known. He's He's written a few books on it. So everything that I'm talking about is, is public knowledge. Um, he had a business called Dr. Global, which was sort of putting medical records online. Um, he got into financial difficulties, uh, fell into depression, and through that process began to realize that the pharmacological uh, interventions weren't helping, and he needed something else. And that's when he got more involved 
and working one-to-one -one with a psychologist um, who was naturally giving him CBT to work with. And he has taken a lot of those concepts, reframed them, repackaged them into uh, healthy thinking. And that's how healthy thinking was born. And I originally came across CB, uh, sorry, healthy thinking when I was evaluating the program uh, in a, a particular bank uh, right across the country. And I was amazed at how effective it was. And that's when I began working more closely with Tom post the evaluation um, and working more closely with the Healthy Thinking Institute. Healthy thinking philosophy goes back a long way, and as, as does the philosophy that underpins CBT. You know, we can take it back to the Stoics, this idea that it's not the events themselves, but how we interpret them that really uh, impact our lives. Uh, we can get triggered, some people can cope well, some people less well. And what we need to be thinking about is, well, what is the process? What is the process that we can learn to help us deal with these emotions in a more effective way, to deal with these thoughts in a more effective way? So the first thing I want to introduce you to is the idea of emotional algebra. One of the key components of healthy thinking, and, and when I say healthy thinking, I'm using that term to refer to CBT, is isolating what the actual thought is. A trigger happens. So, you know, something happens, my camera's not working, uh, I've got this presentation, then I feel an emotion. In the middle of that is a thought. Now, often people don't isolate the thought. They have the trigger, they have the emotion, but they don't isolate the thought. The thought, if I take a case such as my um, camera not working, and I think, oh, it's going to fail, the presentation's going to be a disaster, everyone's going to laugh at me, so on and so forth. I, I project a whole lot of uh, potential things that are going to happen, and I have an emotion associated with that. Whereas if I have a different thought, I will have a different emotion. So the starting point is understanding this emotional algebra, that there is a trigger, there is an emotion, but in the middle of that is a thought, and it's the thought that we want to play with. So as soon as we start to feel an emotion, that should be a wake-up call to say, what was the thought? Don't get lost in the emotion, but what was the thought? And so we've got to have techniques to bring us back to the thought. And that's what I'm going to get into now. So one of the first techniques is this idea of a cognitive switch. So when someone starts to feel heavy emotions or they start to get into a pattern, uh, like a rumination pattern where, this, where a thought is just ruminating round and round, often what they need to do before they can work with the thought is to use a cognitive switch. And a cognitive switch is a mantra or a saying or something that is personal, has meaning uh, to, to the individual, and that clicks their brain into a process of starting to work with that thought. So for example, if I use the example I was using before with the camera, what I'm doing is I'm catastrophizing and I'm thinking into the future. So I might use a switch such as let it be, which is a switch that I do personally use. You know, if, if, if I are starting to feel some of those negative emotions or, or unhealthy emotions, I should say, it's usually because I'm projecting into the future. When I say let it be, or I sing uh, in my best Paul McCartney voice, it reminds me to, to focus on the present, to come back. Now, I'm going to work with the thought that's, that was driving the emotion, but this switch stops me getting too caught up in the emotion, too caught up in the thought. You know, Tom uses one which is uh, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. He'll also one where he'll say crisis equals opportunity. You know, just some saying that you can start to make a habit as a as a switch to stop uh, getting lost in the emotion, stop getting lost in the thought, take yourself out so you can actually work with the thought. One of the key things I want to make clear is this isn't positive thinking. Sometimes those thoughts, sometimes those emotions are very valuable, and we have to differentiate the two. But to do that, we have to take ourselves back. So we have the cognitive switch, technique one. Once we've taken ourselves out, then we can twig the thought. So what was the thought that led to that emotion? Oh, the camera's gonna, uh, won't work and everything's gonna fall apart. Well, I can twig it. Is the thought true? Well, all I have to do is find 
uh, evidence to say that isn't the case. And suddenly that thought isn't true. Is me thinking that thought worth it? Not really, because it doesn't help me actually deal with the camera issue. And that's my goal. So once I have cognitively switched, I twig. I twig the thought. If my answer to any of these questions is no, then the thought is unhealthy. And so there's a different thought. Oh, I've got to work out why my camera is not working. Oh, I see. There's another way of getting around this. Fine. Now I have a different emotion. I haven't tried to control my emotions. I haven't tried to play with my emotions. I've played with the thought. That's the key. People are often told, you know, get happy or, or feel a different thing. It's not the feeling. It's understanding the thought is driving that is driving that emotion. So the technique of cognitive switching and then twigging the thought is very powerful because what it does is it gets you to play with the thought. By playing with the thought, you will indeed change the emotion. So the emotion creates an IOU. The emotion becomes a uh, like almost like a, a guru out here who's telling you, play with your thought, work out what the thought is, twig the thought. So the emotion becomes an IOU to twig the thought. So we've got emotional algebra, trigger, emotion, thought. We've got cognitive switch. And we've got twig. And we're using the emotions as a driver to twig. I'll talk about how we communicate to do buy-in um, at the end of this, because I can talk about some particular case studies. It's a great question, because getting buy-in is, is, is most important. Oh, absolutely. Physical exercise is hugely important. Your brain is just part of your body. <laughs> people don't understand that. Likewise, you know, when people say that eyes are the are the, uh, uh, the lens to the soul. I mean, the reality is that they are actually part of the brain. It's the one part of the brain that is outside of the outside of your head. So thinking that there is this distinction between the brain and the body is just one of the great myths in, in psychology. Um, so if you do get three yeses, then this is something to, this is a healthy thought. Even though it's causing a certain emotion, this is something to do something about. You alert the trigger, you, you work around the trigger. So, you know, if someone is causing you stress at work and you're feeling that stress, well, I have to I have to, uh, I have to approach it. I have to assertively lean into it or I go around it or I might have to, to, to change um, how I'm doing things or who I'm reporting to. There are different ways of, of dealing with that. The key that I want to put up with these three yeses is that it's not about just feeling good. It's about working out whether the thought is effective or ineffective, or in our language, healthy or unhealthy. This is the key. So we use twig to work out the value of that thought. We're not getting lost in the emotion. We're not getting lost in the thought. So this brings us to the, to the Q&A, and there's a great question there about getting buy-in. The beauty of these concepts is there's only sort of four or five concepts to learn. And we can have a lot of fun with them. So, for example, in certain organizations, we'll put up posters and we'll have uh, posters um, where you'll have these things called no moan zones. So areas where, where people can't have just a, 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 uh, a get lost in thoughts, get lost in emotions, um, but they can, uh, uh, they, this is a twigging place. And once we've got the language, and it's almost like competencies, uh, once we've got the language of healthy thinking in the organization, it becomes incredibly powerful. People will, will say to someone in a meeting, oh, did you twig? And this was exactly what came out of the evaluation that I did uh, in this large bank. It was right across the organization. So uh, once we've got languages like cognitive switches, twigging, emotional algebra, everyone's able to communicate in that way. And that's where the power uh, becomes. And so it takes these ideas that have a strong psychological base, strong evidence base, but package them in a way that is meaningful for the organization. And, you know, we've got e-learning on this. Um, so that's one way to, to reinforce it. Posters, we've got books, we've got a whole raft of different things. Um, people can understand their own unhealthy uh, attitudes. What are the styles that they fall into? Uh, those are the sorts of things that we can help with. But, you know, what I want to focus on is this relationship between healthy thinking and CBT and making sure that this becomes 
part of your leadership training. Chris. Fantastic, Paul. I, uh, I always love your presentations. It, it really uh, conjures up um, some, some great questions and some great debate. And um, I, I'm always learning from you. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, we, we, I think you've, you've covered some of these questions. I, I think the, um, uh, we've had uh, another one just in, um, how can we bring positive and healthy thoughts when we're facing so many stresses at one time? I guess, um, you know, we, we've, we've all experienced, um, you know, a, a lot of stresses at, at any one time over the last 12 months, especially. Um, but, um, but, but any tips that you can provide the audience there when, um, when sometimes there's just so many things coming at once? Absolutely. It again is the same, same process that the, the emotions. So when we talk about stresses and the feelings related with the stresses, we, we can call them emotions in the sense that they're a cognitive appraisal of something that we're feeling in our body. And by learning this process of healthy thinking, uh, by learning how to twig the thought, we begin to control how we're feeling about those stresses. We can't train, change those stresses. One of the, the key components of this approach is learning what is, what is in your control and what is external. And once you learn that, hey, this is external to me, I have no control over it. So then, then you twig and you go, yes, it is true. But it's not worth it for me to, to, to be thinking this thought because it doesn't bring me closer to my goal, because it's something external. There's nothing that I can do about it. So having the thought and the emotion associated with it isn't as helpful as having a different thought. And it's like any skill. You have to practice it. Once you start practicing these techniques and once you start making them uh, habitual, that's when you start to see the benefit. You know, I think often when uh, people are looking at uh, mental health in the workplace they're thinking that there's a magic cure there's a, a set of beans that they can have and everything's solved this is a technique which has to be practiced but once it becomes practiced once it becomes learned uh, it becomes a go-to and you just start naturally going through it yeah yeah Fantastic. And, uh, and and for those just going back to that original question, I think uh, that there may be um, people in the audience who, who have that traditional leadership. They might not be able to get, um, you know, if they if they come uh, with with a with uh, this idea that we want to bring that positive um, uh, attitude uh, to, to the leadership team. And, and any tips on how we can really galvanize the interest from across leadership um, to, to, to start thinking this way? Yeah, sure. I think the, the key is uh, thinking of it as a skill that everybody wants. Pe the beauty of this is that it's not just work related. Once you've developed the skill, it, it trans translates into all areas of your life. So people have a personal buy-in to it. We know that to create a uh, real buy-in, they need an intrinsic reason to do it. Everyone wants to be intrinsically healthy. You know, we've spoken about the body and this is just, this is exactly the same for the mind. So we want to be able to, to be in control of our mind. What could be better than being in control of our mind? What could be better than not being affected by the uh, ebb and flow of these affects that our body is sending us all the time? What could be better than that? What we've got to do is we've got to package it in leadership terms. So that's where this, this terminology becomes very powerful. Where we're talking about the impact on productivity. We're talking about the impact on, on work. But the work and well-being thing, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure that I'm preaching to the converted here, it's intertwining. At last, it is starting to be one. People are starting to say, hold on, workplaces have a role in ensuring that um, people are, are mentally strong, mentally well. We spend a lot of time at work. So having these techniques, taking all of the psyche spin off it, putting it into the right sort of language, incredibly powerful. And I think also, if you if if you look at uh, somewhere like the the, the you know sporting industries, um, uh, athletes, that this that this has been something that's practiced um, for for so long. And uh, and if you if you read about you know gold medal winners from the Olympics and the most successful teams, this is this is built in their right. uh, in in their psyche. So you know if we can bring that to the workplace as well, organisations and corporations are going to be more successful. Absolutely. I mean, all of the work that I do in terms of executive work is all in what we call optimal performance. It's not dealing with dysfunctions. It's dealing with optimal performance. And it's the same technique. So you use healthy thinking uh, as, a, as a technique for optimal performance. How do you know when that emotion is something that, that's, that's, a, that's a proper trigger 
versus something that is that you that you don't have to worry about. How do you learn how to to control your mind? That is the the that is what differentiates us in a cognitive world, and so it is the core skill that those who are aiming for optimal performance need to be focused on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, involved in the uh, in the events and you always do a, uh, a fantastic job. Um, thank you for for, for helping our, uh, to educate uh, and to provide uh, some, some great tips uh, for the audience. I'd really encourage uh, the audience to reach out to Paul. Um, they, uh, they, they have some amazing um, training and, uh, and solutions for you at Opera Group. Um, so please reach out to Paul and, uh, and make that connection. You can either do it on the platform. They've got a booth as well uh, in the partners section. So thank you very much, Paul. Um, and talking of connections, we've, we've now got a, a nice break for you for 30 minutes. So, so please make those connections um, on the platform. Uh, get in touch with Paul and others. And, uh, and we'll see you back for the uh, uh, panel discussion at uh, 10 o'clock Singapore time. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Cheers. See ya.